Good afternoon, everyone. Hello from Maureen Fitzgerald at City Match and on behalf of the whole training course in MCH Epidemiology. Um, if you weren't available for last week's webinar, we're excited to have you part of today's second pre-course webinar. Um, looks like we still have people joining us, and but we're going to go ahead and get started and talk to you about today's webinar. This is Statistical and Epidemiologic Framework for MCH Analysis with Dr. Kristen Rankin. So the purpose of this webinar is to lay a statistical and epidemiologic groundwork for analytic methods that are going to be discussed during the week-long training. Dr. Rankin will include a review of basic statistical and epidemiologic principles to set the stage for more in-depth analytic lectures in Clearwater. And just a little bit about um, Dr. Rankin. Kristen is assistant professor in the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health. In addition to teaching academic courses such as intermediate epidemiologic methods and advanced applied methods in MCH epidemiology, Dr. Rankin has served as a faculty member for this national training course in MCH epi for the past nine years and is the lead trainer for a distance-based analytic capacity building initiative for City Match, or sorry, for CDC MCH EPI assignees to state health agencies. Dr. Rankin was recognized for this work by the Coalition for Excellence in MCH Epidemiology in 2016, where she was the recipient of the Excellence in Teaching and Mentoring Award. Dr. Rankin's research focuses on health services, social determinants of health in MCH populations. She has led or contributed to numerous studies utilizing MCH surveillance data sources such as PRAMS, vital statistics, Medicaid claims data, hospital discharge data, prenatal care records, and the NSCH. So a few housekeeping tasks before we begin. First, um, in terms of the audio, this webinar as always, begins in listen-only mode, even for our presenter. Um, to unmute your phone, if you have a question or are getting ready to present, press star 7 on your phone. So star 7 will unmute you. And then when you're done presenting or asking a, your question, please press star 6 to remute your phone. And if there's a time that we plan to unmute all of the lines, we will give you a heads up. You know, we know that people are busy and they're often multitasking in their rooms, so we'll give you a 30-second warning that we're about to um, go turn the whole thing live. Um, we ask you to not place the webinar on hold at any time. If you do have to step out, just keep your phone on mute, or if need be, disconnect your phone line and call back in. That will not disrupt in any way. And as you should already know, but I want to reiterate, we do record these webinars. They are archived so that you and other participants um, who were unable to join us can tap into today's learning. And if for some reason you're disconnected and, and, uh, or whatever, have to leave early, you'll be able to access the final information through the archive. At this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kristen Rankin to press Star 7 and join the webinar. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm looking forward to spending the next about hour or so with you, um, just kind of greasing the wheels for some of the more in-depth analytic work we'll be doing on site in Clearwater next week. Um, I can say on behalf of myself and all the faculty, we're really looking forward to meeting all of you. Um, this is always a really inspiring week um, for all of us to meet all of you doing such great work um, in your states, territories, and localities. Um, so with that said, I'm going to dive into the material for today. Um, after first acknowledging my mentor, um, Deb Rosenberg, who um, was the leader of this training course, for several years. She has actually been training in this course since 2000. And she'll be doing a post-training webinar 
um, this year, but will not be joining us on site because um, she has retired and is doing um, very interesting stuff. I'll talk about more on site. But really, she um, developed a lot of these training materials um, that we built on over time. So I wanted to give her the acknowledgement she deserves. Um, so this talk today um, well, is entitled, Where in the World is MCH Epidemiology? Um, and from my childhood, there was a game show called Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? I don't know if anybody remembers that or if anybody's seen the more recent reincarnation on SNL. Um, but we're going to start with this look into what, where is our work situated and then how do statistical and epi methods fit in. Um, so we're going to locate MCH epi within our practice frameworks and then within the sampling and epi framework. So first of all, hopefully this is um, familiar to all of you, but if it's not, you're going to hear Dr. Bill Sampenfield talk a lot about the MCH planning cycle, which is on the left in this slide here. Um, so that's um, going from planning and assessment to developing strategies to address the problems that we've identified through assessment. Planning, then doing and implementing those strategies monitoring our indicators over time, and evaluating the strategies. And it's a cycle because our understanding of how those strategies work or those programs work feed back into our needs assessment to understand what is still needed in our jurisdictions. On the right, you just see the wheel. Um, if you had a Public Health 101 course, these are the 10 essential functions of public health. And we as MCH EPIs contribute to both of these. And more specifically, in more detail, um, this is a slide that Deb developed that I think is really helpful to think about all of the different ways in which we as MCHEPIs contribute to the planning cycle. So there's there are obvious things on here, like producing descriptive statistics, monitoring indicators, but then also um, you see along the right um, that we, sorry, let me get the little arrow going over here that we contribute to setting the MCH agenda as well. Um, we need to think of ourselves as MCH epidemiologists as contributing to what strategies um, do get um, implemented in our jurisdiction and in supporting the prioritization process to understand um, where to focus our efforts. Also, you know, we need to think about our leadership role in promoting data systems development, data linkage, to improve um, the capacity of what we can do with our data to inform programs and policies. And so here is just um, a recent job description for an MCH epidemiologist. And all of these functions probably look very familiar to you since you're currently um, in that role in your um, agencies. Um, but this is why we're always so busy. Um, because we are responsible for a lot um, and have a lot of things usually in the air at one time that we're trying to keep going. Um, but I think it's such a crucial function and I'm really um, proud to be a part of the MCH EPI community and to, to work with all of you on this really important work. Um, so that was just to set the stage. I'm going to talk now a little bit about how we use statistics and EPI in our work to support the, all those functions. So as we know, statistics and EPI are tools for describing, explaining, or predicting the experience of a population. We use statistical methods um, as the mathematical rules for estimation and hypothesis testing. And our EPI skills really focus those mathematical rules on the occurrence and pattern of disease in human populations. Um, and I would argue that that description is even probably too narrow for what we do as MCH EPIs because we're looking a lot at occurrence of health services and how health systems work together, um, not just on health status or um, disease in the, in the population. Also, if you want to think about it kind of from a, an assets-based approach, we also focus on um, protective factors and um, uh, 
well-being as well. But I think that epi tools are really important um, and that we're really valuable as epidemiologists. I have to say I get a little, a little offended when people refer to me as a statistician because I think we have um, a lot to offer beyond just statistical methods and really helping to think through how to frame an issue, um, how to use the methods um, in a way that is going to um, really affect change in, for our MCH epi, or for our MCH populations. Um, and that requires knowing the landscape of all the issues, knowing all the programs, knowing all the different population groups we serve, and understanding how to maximize our use of the statistics to create information that's really going to lead to practice or policy change. Um, so that said, we do need the statistical methods, and um, the sampling framework is really the basis for a lot of it. Um, and the sampling fr framework includes kind of two different um, aspects. One is estimation, where we're estimating population characteristics, such as demographics, but also disease incidence, um, indicators of access to care. Um, and we can also estimate not just those measures of occurrence, but also associations between two or more population characteristics. With hypothesis testing, we can actually test hypotheses about um, those popular population characteristics and the relationship between them. From the epi framework side, we also have kind of two sides of the coin. One is descriptive epidemiology, which is summarizing the distribution of risk, ma risk markers, risk factors, and outcomes in a community without any explicit causal um, hypotheses. Um, whereas analytic epi takes that a step further and tests hypotheses about relationships between risk factors and outcomes. And um, like I said before, in public health, it's even broader than that. Um, we're testing hypotheses about health services, health programs, health policies, and about how social determinants of health affect our MCH outcomes. Um, so in order to create information from all the data we have, we really need to summarize the data. Um, we want to make sure the data are organized to facilitate that summarization, and that we choose analysis methods that are going to summarize the data in a way that creates information. Um, so when we typically get a raw data set, we're going to have a set of observations or unit of analysis, which are typically our rows in a spreadsheet or a data file. And those rows, each row might represent an individual person, um, such as like in PRAMS data, we have individual women who were sampled in PRAMS. Um, or it may represent an aggregate. So you might have a county level data set where you have rates of a specific outcome or demographic um, characteristics of a county um, or a census tract. Or you can imagine there's different ways um, that the data might be aggregated. Um, and then in the columns, we usually have our variables or our fields where we've measured the characteristics and the ap attributes um, of our population. So just, um, just to get us started, we want to think about how to summarize that raw data to create information. So we're going to go into a little statistical methods refresher. And I want to start by first doing a poll. Um, so I'm curious, how long has it been since you had a formal course in statistics? Um, so if you can respond to the poll, um, I'll close it in about a minute and see what the results are. Okay, we're almost up to everybody participating, so I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results. Um, and it's as I expected. Um, you know, the majority of you, it's been at least three, and for some of you, greater than five years since you had a formal course in statistics. But none of you responded that you never did. So this is in there somewhere, and I'm going to try to bring 
um, some of these fundamentals back to the surface because we don't think about them a lot um, on a day-to-day -day basis. I know I don't even myself. Um, so I'm going to try to bring back the, some of these fundamental principles to really get us started to delve in deeper to the analytic methods that we're going to talk about on site. So first of all, um, there's in, in statistics we always have a population parameter which summarizes the attributes of an entire population and then the statistics about the population which, which summarize the attributes of a sample or a subset of the population. Um, and one key thing um, that took a long time for me to get my head around, and Deb had to kind of tell me this over and over again, um, but, but is that all data we report are statistics. We never really know the true population parameters. Um, so even though, take a data source like vital statistics data, we might have all live births recorded, right? We hope we have all live births. We probably have very close to all of them recorded in our state vital statistics data, right? Um, so given that we have the full population of, of infants born and women giving birth, are the values reported from those data population parameters or statistics? Are they true values or are they estimates and why does it matter? So we're going to delve into that a little bit. So an annual infant mortality rate in the area is based on a known number of infant deaths um, over that total number of live births in vital statistics. A sample isn't drawn. We hopefully have all of the infant deaths enumerated in our area. But infant deaths occurring in a given year might have incurred in the previous or following year, depending on a host of factors which operate randomly. So just to give you an example, if we wanted to, I'll walk through this, um, this example here about neonatal mortality rates among Native American births. So first of all, neonatal mortality is a rare outcome, um, and Native Americans um, are a small population. Um, so you can imagine that our estimates, um, you know, may be very, um, may be um, affected easily by um, small numbers issues. So here in this question, which, which region has a higher rate? In region five, the actual rate of neonatal mortality among um, Native American births is 3.9 per thousand. And in Region 7, it's 3.0 per thousand. And notice the different denominators. We have 3,364 um, Native American births in Region 5 versus 993 in Region 7. Um, but what if, um, sorry, I'm playing with my arrows. What if, um, that th one of those 13 deaths on the left in Region 5, what if that death um, occurred in a different year? You know, what if it occurred um, to a baby that was born um, on January 1st, 1990, instead of December 31st, um, 1989? That death would have gotten enumerated in a different year. And the infant mortality and the neonatal mortality rate would have been 3.6 instead. Um, similarly, if the opposite was true in Region 7 and there was one more death in 1989, the hypothetical rate would have been 4.0. So you can see that just one, a shift in one death, one way or the other, um, in each region could change your conclusions about which region had the higher rate. Um, so even though we have the whole population enumerated, this host of random factors about when the, um, when the death occurred or to a baby born in which year, um, I'll make these sample statistics rather than population parameters. We're never going to know the true infant mortality rate, so we have to do our best to estimate with our sample statistics. Um, therefore, all health data should be reported and analyzed as though it were sample data. 
Um, and this distinction between population and sample are relevant because of the, it is like the theoretical under, underpinning of all statistical methods. Um, and we know that all the most commonly used stat methods assume that a simple random sample is taken. Now we know with some of our complex sample surveys like PRAMS and National Survey of Children's Health and BRFIS um, that there's um, more of a stratified um, random sampling in post. Um, but all of our statistical methods are based on kind of the simple random sample and then there's modifications made um, when we've imposed the design on that sampling, either to oversample um, in certain areas. Um, and this concept of a sim simple random sample is, um, the, is fundamental for all statistics. Um, what we're going to acknowledge since we have sample data is that our results might by chance be somewhat different from another sample taken from the same population. Um, so like I said before, that truth about the population is never fully known, um, but we can un account for our, un our uncertainty and inaccuracy um, using the sampling error or random error, um, which is going to be a part of all statistical analysis. So just to put this in um, more practical terms, suppose we took a sample of children with special health care needs and other colleagues also sampled the same population of CSHCN. But we may get a different value than our colleagues for the percent who receive specialty care, the percent of families below the federal poverty level, um, and the difference in the percent of received specialty care according to income level. Um, but whose data are correct? And what probability theory allows us is a set of mathematical rules um, that allow us to objectively evaluate the accuracy of sample statistics we report. So to understand that it, different samples from the same population may come up with different, um, different estimates, but then there is um, random error around, uh, around those estimates that we can use um, to really des describe the, the stability of those estimates. And there are certain probability distributions that describe how the values in a statistic would, would change if different samples were drawn from a population. Um, and that's assuming the probability distributions assume an infinite number of samples from the population. And the sampling distributions provide that frame of re reference for judging the accuracy of estimates. So here I've just listed a few of the different um, population distributions that are commonly used um, from the normal, which is probably the most um, familiar to all of you, you know, to the binomial, chi-square, um, exponential, et cetera. We will, you'll be seeing a lot of these words again as we start to talk about regression modeling next. I think it's Wednesday we'll start to talk about that, um, and you'll know that these these refer back to these probability distributions. And each probability distribution in this exponential family are completely defined by your mean and your variance. Okay, so let's put this into terms that we, we use all the time. Um, the sample statistics we use most of the time um, for measures of occurrence are means, proportions, and rates. Um, and they describe the average experience um, of an average population. The means being the average of um, a continuous variable um, where they're assumed to follow a normal distribution. Proportions, which is what we're going to mostly talk about in this training course um, and is what we mostly talk about in epidemiology for a number of reasons that we'll discuss a little later. Um, but proportions summarize discrete variables and are assumed to follow the binomial distribution. Um, sometimes for rare outcomes, we're also using rates, and those are Poisson distributed. In addition to those measures of occurrence, the measures of association that we're typically using in EPI um, include dif difference measures and ratio measures. So the difference measures might be between two or more means. 
between two or more proportions, which is also called a risk difference or attributable risk. Or we could be um, looking at the difference between a mean and a standard or a proportion and a standard. Um, for instance, if you want to see if your rate of a particular indicator is significantly different from the Healthy People 2020 objective, you might be using a statistical test to compare your proportion versus the, that standard. Um, for ratio measures, um, we're probably all familiar with relative risk, um, relative prevalence, also called prevalence ratios, odds ratios, rate ratios, hazard ratios. Um, Epi has kind of been obsessed with ratio measures. Um, and you'll, you'll see on site that we're going to try to pay as equal attention to risk differences as we are to risk ratios, and that we're kind of going to dog the odds ratio um, for many good reasons that Dr. Harai will tell you more about next week. Um, but the odds ratio is probably what um, is most, you have most commonly used and most EPIs have used um, previously, but we'll, we'll talk more in depth about that next week and some alternatives to it. So when we want to assess the accuracy of statistics, we use those probability distributions that we talked about um, to evaluate how close or far from the truth our statistics are. So our measures of occurrence, our measure of association, how far are those from the truth? And then we do that by calculating a range of values that include the true population value with a given probability. So if we are calculating 95% confidence intervals with a given probability of, of 5%, um, we're um, going to evaluate how close or far from the truth our estimate is. So we're going to calculate those 95% confidence intervals around measures of occurrence, um, or measures of association. And here I just give you a very um, kind of high level view of confidence intervals. And in the appendix, you actually have the, um, the how to calculate a confidence interval around each type of measure of occurrence and each type of measure of association. I just thought it would be kind of brutal to go through the, the Greek on this webinar right now. So I just summarized it into Confidence interval equals that observed measure of occurrence, so here's our estimate, plus or minus the critical value, and this comes from the probability distribution, times the standard error of the measure of occurrence. Um, for a measure of association, we have that observed association, plus or minus the critical value um, from the probability distribution times the standard error of the association. Um, and that's all going to be, you know, you have to uh, establish the given probability, but usually we're reporting 95% confidence intervals, and so we get the critical value from the table for the 5% probability. So this, um, the narrow confidence interval then is going to indicate that the sample estimate is probably quite close to the population value. Um, and that makes sense. I mean, we know that confidence intervals are narrower when sample size is larger. If we have a larger sample from our population, we're more likely to have, um, you know, uh, an estimate that is quite close to that population value. Whereas a wide confidence interval indicates that the sample estimate might actually be quite far from that population truth. Um, so just to go through a couple of examples, um, and here is where I like a little class participation, if you all are willing and ready. Um, so if you'd like to respond to the question I'm going to ask in a couple minutes, then you can hit star 7 to unmute your line. Um, so here the example is, um, what is the proportion of the population with health insurance coverage? Um, and we've estimate from our sample of that population that 85% are covered. Um, and the 95% confidence interval we calculate with the formula that we got from the appendix 
is 81 to 89 percent. So what's the interpretation of this confidence interval? Star seven if you want to answer. Hi, can I make a guess? <laughs> Please do, and thank you for being <laughs> I think, if I remember correctly, that it's if the uh, the true proportion is 85% in the population, that in uh, 95 out of 100 samples, we would um, get a uh, sample proportion between 81 and 89? The second part was definitely right. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you, you got that piece of it. What I actually have here is we're 95% certain that the true proportion of people with health insurance is somewhere between 81 and 89%. But the 85% itself is just the estimate from our sample. The 95% confidence intervals kind of describe that range. So great. Um, you, you really um, you nailed it on the second part. We'll pretend you didn't say the first part. Um, and what is, what is your name? Oh, sorry, you already. Oh, sorry, I'm I uh, I'm John Davy from Vermont. Great, we look forward to uh, meeting you on site, John. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I'm excited. Thanks. Um, so then, if that was a confidence interval around a measure of occurrence, just the health insurance prevalence, um, then if we're going to um, have a confidence interval around the measure of association. Um, we're, if that confidence interval for a difference measure, so say we're taking the difference in the prevalence of health insurance coverage for two different groups, if that difference includes zero, there's evidence that the means or proportions being compared may be equal, um, and there might not be a, a significant difference between them. Um, if zero is not in the interval, then that's evidence that the means or proportions may, in fact, be different. And you can see all of the kind of hedging language that we use um, in statistics and in EPI um, because we are, you know, dealing with imperfect data. We're dealing with um, sa samples from a population, so the error that's involved in that. Um, so there's a lot of, I use the word may a lot. <laughs> Um, because you never want to kind of totally commit when you don't have the truth, right? Um, but I think we can learn a lot from our samples and our sample statistics um, and still interpret with caution. Um, if, so for a difference measure, that, that null value is going to be zero, that we're really looking to see whether the confidence interval includes that null value. But also, kind of the width, around, width of a confidence interval, which will indicate kind of the stability of that estimate of the measure of association. Now, if we had a ratio measure like a risk ratio, um, if that confidence interval for that ratio measure includes one, there's evidence that the proportions being compared may be equal. Um, but if one's not in the interval, we have some evidence that the proportions may, in fact, be different. So here's that example. If we looked at health insurance prevalence now for females versus males, um, and we want to know if the prevalence is different for females versus males, um, we could calculate, um, and this would be a prevalence difference. So if it's 87% for females and 84% for males, our difference measure is 3%. And we calculate a 95% confidence interval of negative 1% to 7%. So does someone else want to be uh, brave like Don and uh, answer what is the interpretation of this 95% confidence interval? Um, and remember, you can hit star 7 to unmute the line. Um, hi, so you can say it's not a statistically significant difference because it violates zero in the confidence interval, um, which is for the difference, the criteria. Great. Thank you for your response. And what's your name? Helena. Helena, I look forward to meeting you on site too. 
Um, I've been working with all your names because I've been putting you in groups. So I I recognize your names even if I haven't met you in person yet. So um, thank you for that answer, Helena. Um, that is true. It is true that we don't, um, because zero is in the confidence interval, we have evidence to suggest that that prevalence um, is not different between females and males. Um, but we also know a little bit more than just the fact that they're, um, they're not statistically different. We also kind of have a range um, of values for the true difference between negative 1% and 7%. So if we think about the 95% confidence interval as providing us with that additional information, um, we might look at it a little bit differently and say, well, you know, the range actually favors values above a zero, um, and maybe we, we don't want to disregard this as a, um, as a potential true difference, um, but we want to acknowledge that, you know, since zero is in the confidence interval, um, we can't say with certainty that these values are actually different. So I guess I'm challenging you all to use the 95% confidence intervals. Um, use the, uh, all of the information we get from them to make a decision um, that isn't just based on yes or no is statistically significant. Um, and a lot of that's kind of been inspired by um, the American Statistical Association, you know, came out with a statement last year right in the middle of <laughs> the semester where I was teaching Epi Methods, um, you know, talking about how we've been kind of misusing um, the p-value especially, but they talked about confidence intervals as well, and just kind of as a dichotomy, statistical significant yes or no based on a dichotomous p value, dichotomous cut of p-values, and how we're not really understanding kind of the true um, distribution of the data in that way. Um, and their statement is very interesting and brief um, if you're interested and you want to look. In fact, I'll post it on our Google Drive um, next week so you can download it if you're interested. But that's a good segue because I already kind of jumped into talking about p-values, but we're also going to talk a little bit about statistical tests here. Um, so confidence intervals actually only provide evidence for or against equality, um, like, like you just um, mentioned, Helena, that um, since zero was in the estimate, you know, we had some evidence um, for equality of the prevalence estimates for health insurance for men and women. But statistical tests actually go beyond this by telling us the exact probability that a difference we see in our sample is due solely to chance imposed by the sampling process. So the chance that the sample we took from the population um, was not representative of the population. Um, and this probability is called the p-value, and by convention, we use this p-value of less than 0.05 for statistical significance, but like I said, it's important to recognize the p-values are a continuous variable. They're on a continuum, and we're kind of falsely dichotomizing um, at 0.05 because, you know, what they argue in this ASA statement is that a p-value of 0.0001 it's quite different than a p-value of 0 0.045, but we're considering them equally, whereas, you know, a p-value of 0 0.049 and 0 0.051 on either side of that cutoff um, could lead us to make quite different conclusions, and um, that can really, you know, affect how we act on those results. Um, where the difference is even is only very slight um, in those statistical significant um, levels, in the p-value levels. Um, so the ASA is much more articulate about this than I am, so I will definitely post that statement. Um, but in the meantime, I wanted to give you, I know it's been a while since you've taken statistics courses, um, but I wanted to give you a little quiz. Um, does anybody remember what statistical test is generally used to compare two or more proportions? Um, so I'll give you about a minute to complete this poll.
Okay, well, 60% of you got this. Oh, it's going down. Stop answering. You're wrong. <laughs> um, six, sorry, 51.7% of you um, said chi-square test, and that is true. The t-test is actually, um, it, you may have used it quite a lot in your st statistics courses. Um, that's actually testing the difference in two means. So the mean being the average of, the, of a continuous variable. And ANOVA actually allows you to test the difference in means for um, two or more groups. So it extends the t-test. Um, but the chi-square test is what we really use when we're testing the difference in two or more proportions, um, relying on that binomial distribution. The Wilkson rank sum test is um, for uh, non-parametric test, um, uh, you know, when you're looking at differences in um, the distribution for uh, non-normally distributed um, variables. Um, so thanks for your participation in the poll. We will talk a lot more about chi-square tests um, next week. Um, so we'll, we'll be really focusing on that realm. We'll talk very little about t-tests or ANOVAs um, because we're in the realm of proportions most of the time in our epi work. Um, so here is just uh, um, one example of a, statistic, of a statistical test, and this is the Pearson's chi-square test of general association. Um, this can be calculated from a two-by-two two table, which we'll talk about toward the end of today's lecture, um, if you have two dichotomous variables. But it can also be calculated from a broader table. So say you have a four-by-two table, or you have um, more categories than just two for either your exposure or your outcome. Um, so this formula extends to um, multiple categories. And this might look familiar to you because it's kind of the basis of all statistical tests. But you usually have an observed minus an expected over an expected. And in this case, it's the sum of the observed frequency in each cell of the table minus the expected frequency squared, um, hence chi-square, um, over the expected frequency, where we calculate the expected value for each cell as the row total times the column total, where that cell is situated, over the total sample size, or the total n. Um, so I promise we will not be calculating chi-square statistics by hand, um, because usually our statistical software is nice enough to do that for us. Um, but I did want to remind you kind of where the formula comes from um, and why the test is important. And for us, it's to compare two proportions and generate that p-value, which is the continuous variable telling us the probability that, that um, those proportions are different by chance alone. All right, so now just to summarize, that was like my very brief overview of the sampling framework, just to again get the wheels greased a little bit for next week. Um, so just in summary, statistics summarize sample data. Um, all statistics are estimates and therefore are in error to one degree or another. And we can express the degree of error through confidence intervals or statistical testing, which is essential for interpreting the statistics we report. And just, just as a, a, another summary or review, the basic components of any statistical analysis include a sample statistic, our observed value, a population parameter, which is our expected value, which we're never measuring directly, right? Um, our sample size, um, one or more sample variances or standard errors, and then your critical value from the appropriate probability distribution. Um, so all of those come together into our statistical analysis. And now we're going to talk about how we um, use those statistics within the epidemiology framework. So in contrast to a typical epi study um, that might be just looking at one exposure and one outcome or a risk factor for a disease, 
you know, smoking and lung cancer, I think, is what we all learn in Epi 101. Um, in contrast to that, in MCH Epi um, and the public health in general, we're often focusing on multiple population groups and multiple domains simultaneously, thinking about summarizing data across all of these different cells of this matrix. Um, so we have women, infants, children, adolescents, CSHDN. Um, many MCH programs will also include families, fathers, men, you know, I mean, we basically keep growing to, you know, encompass all population groups. Um, and then across these domains of health status, health services, and health systems. Um, and if you're doing program evaluation, which Dr. Pat Ocampo will be talking about um, more next week, you're um, crossing two domains because you're looking at the impact of health services on health status outcomes. Um, so you can see where our analyses fall in these different um, cells. And when we're summarizing data, we, we always kind of go back to the three pillars of epidemiology, person, place, and time, right? Understanding how our MCH indicators um, vary across these um, different characteristics help us to understand the needs in our communities um, and help us to generate hypotheses for what might be causing those differences. So we need this EPI framework overlaid on the statistical math methods to decide what indicators are important to consider, um, what characteristics, person, place, and time, risk factors, and outcomes do we want to prioritize in our analytic work. Um, and that should be all kind of folded into the whole prioritization process with your Title V um, needs assessment. Um, we're we're going to, as EPIs, think about what data are or will be available to measure those indicators. Um, are there relevant existing sources or will we have to collect new data? How um, high quality are those um, available indicators? Um, and what analytic methods should be used? Descriptive statistics, hypothesis testing, or estimation? And it's often useful to think through before you dive into the analysis process itself um, that what is your analysis plan going to be? How will the data be organized? And what statistical approaches will be used? So I always recommend before ever diving into an, an analytic um, exercise to uh, first map out what you're going to do what the purpose of that is, and how you're going to be translating the information you generate to stakeholders to try to move the needle on a certain outcome. Um, so I think the systematic analysis plan really helps you to not go down um, rabbit holes um, in your data that get really interesting, um, but that may not lead to actionable information. Um, so that a systematic analysis plan really provides a blueprint um, to facilitate those core functions of assessment, assurance, and policy development, which support each stage in that planning cycle. And you're much more likely to translate useful information to program planners, managers, and policymakers if you start with um, what you want your end product to be. If you know the message that you want to convey um, and start from there and work backwards to see how you can pull together data to support that message. Um, it's a lot more focused and targeted, um, an efficient way to go about it. So the components of that analysis plan for descriptive epi would be to select variables of interest, define categories for variables if appropriate, plan univariate analyses, plan your bivariate analyses, construct shells of potential tables, um, shells of charts and graphs, and articulate your potential narrative. And yes, I'm saying to do all of this before you know what the results are going to be. Because how many times do we really know before we go into an analysis what the results are going to be? 
Um, but we really just need to do the analysis to prove it to ourselves. A lot of times we can anticipate what those results will be and how we're going to translate it, then work backward to provide the data to support it. Um, within and across data source, we can use multiple versions of an indicator. We can select multiple versions for analysis. Is the overall frequency of occurrence in our jurisdiction? We could be estimating just the frequency of occurrence, how many people had a particular outcome. We could use a rate by putting that over the population denominator. Or we could look by subpopulations of our, um, of our jurisdiction. We could look at geographic variation, time trends, or we can combine multiple related indicators. We have a lot of different options when we're looking across um, multiple indicators as we always, often are in MCHEP. Um, and sometimes we have to present more data than we would like because we need to use several less than optimal measures in an attempt to approximate the information contained in an indicator if it's unavailable itself. Um, also, sometimes we use data that is of poor quality because no high quality alternative is available. And here is where I would argue that it's our job um, to do something about the quality of the data, to try to um, improve the quality of the data and communicate to, um, to the appropriate stakeholders that we need to improve that quality. Um, but perhaps the most problematic is that sometimes we misspecify the questions we ask because of the constraints of the existing data. Um, so, you know, I've seen a lot of people ask questions about factors that are related within the PRAMS data set because there's available data for them um, and they can ask the question and answer the question within PRAMS. Um, but sometimes that question may not be the right question to help um, move or to help inform your programs and your policies. So it's really trying to think creatively about how to use data maybe to link data, to um, improve upon the data we have to answer the questions of consequence um, rather than just analyzing something because we have the data available to us. Um, and as MCH professionals, like I was saying before, there are many indicators um, that would enhance our ability to carry out the core functions of public health, but they're not available. So one really good example of this is that it would be really great to be able to report the incidence of child injury by type of injury and age. Um, but I can tell you that um, I have three little girls and each of them has sustained, you know, luckily for me, minor injuries over time, but that would still be defined as an injury. And there's no way to count them in an incidence of injury because I didn't seek, you know, formal medical care for them um, because they didn't need it, not because I'm a terrible mom. Um, so since the true incidence data are not readily available, we often use hospitalization for injury or injury mortality, or those are reported as instead, despite the limitations of the fact that we're only capturing the most severe injuries and not more information about the less severe injuries that might help us understand how to move the um, injuries from the continuum of, you know, um, more severe to less severe. It would be great to have, you know, an understanding of all the childhood injuries, but we just don't have that data available to us. So we triangulate using the data that we do have. Um, so a lot of what I was just describing is our, is our descriptive epidemiology, right? Taking our indicators, looking by person, place, and time, really doing the surveillance and monitoring. And it is a core function of public health, and it is so important. Um, and often, you know, the most important thing, I think. But often that descriptive epi will prompt more focused analytic questions about certain factors that might be causing an adverse health, health status and health service outcome. Um, and that's where we need analytic epidemiology to start to um, test relationships between 
um, certain exposures or strategies and our outcomes. And our well-crafted analytic epi questions guide the systematic planning of our research. And if you formulate those questions precisely, it enables you to just design a study with a good chance of answering them. Um, and I, I added on here that really asking those consequential questions, the questions that are going to lead to data that are really going to address a priority in your jurisdiction and are really going to produce data that will um, help understand how to make change to improve our indicators, really asking those consequential questions will maximize impact. Um, so I'm curious at this point, I have one more poll. Um, which of the following activities occupies most of your time during a typical day at work? Um, and I probably didn't come up with the full universe of activities, so you can choose none of the above um, if I didn't pick what you spend most of your time doing. But I do have descriptive epi analysis here, analytic epi analysis, supervision, stakeholder engagement, can you just respond um, about what you're doing on most of the time of during a typical day at your job? Okay, so here are our results. And this is um, it's what I did expect to see, that about 76% of you are mostly doing descriptive epi. Um, and I think there is a lot of descriptive epi to do. And like I said, it's very um, important work. Um, what we're hoping through the training is to give you the tools um, for analytic epi um, so that you can use it um, as appropriate and as needed to really answer the consequence, consequential questions that come up in your agency. Um, now I'm curious, does anybody want to chime in and say what the none of the above, anybody who said none of the above, do you want to chime in and say what you do um, most of the time typically at work? And you might want to think before saying something like Facebook or something like that. We are recording this. But does, if anybody wants to share what they spend the most time doing, you can hit star seven. Hi, this is Janice. Hi, Janice. Um, <clears throat> so what I do, I do, I do get to do a little bit of descriptive at B once in a while, but mostly what I do is uh, I interface with our data system managers, um, and then also with our our data system users. So there's a lot of a lot of TA and a lot of development and that type of work that that I do. So that's great because you're building capacity for the data systems, but also improving data quality by working with users. So those are really important core functions that I forgot to include of an MCHIP. And you know, working with the users also helps us. Um, well, helps me figure out how to appropriately ask those questions to get the data that we need to report on. So um, it's kind of nice. Great. That's a great example. Thanks for sharing and uh, look forward to meeting you on site. Yes, I'm very excited. Thank you. Um, does one more person want to share maybe? we had? I guess we had four people say none of the above. So one of the other three of you. Hi, this is Melissa from Wyoming. Hi, Melissa. Um, I feel like a lot of my time is spent um, on the program side lately, developing program evaluation. So I think I get to the descriptive epi once we start getting our surveys back and things like that, but I spend a lot of time with the program in the initial development of that. Great. So in the design portion of the work, too. Great. Thank you guys for sharing. Um, I'm going to, we have just a few slides left if you can hang with me. I did want to just, since I referred to it earlier, and it really is kind of the core of all of our epi analysis, I did want to talk briefly about the 2 by 2 table. Um, the 2 by 2 table is our typical way to organize epi data. Um, where on the left, and some people draw the 2 by 2 table differently, 
Um, I had a professor at Emory in my MPH who always put the exposure across the top and the disease across the side. And, for you know, it's really hard if you're used to doing it one way to flip your brain the other way. But I think most people usually have your the exposure on the left here. So an exposure here, when I'm seeing exposure throughout the training, I'm talking about anything from, you know, a typical risk factor like smoking to, you know, an exposure to preventive care like a well woman visit or um, exposure to, you know, a particular program like home visiting um, or exposure to a policy or exposure to, you know, um, and this could be all of our person, place, or time variables come along here too. Um, and so that's on the left, and then you have your disease or other health outcome along the top. Um, and I'll say there's one factor I just mentioned that could also be my health outcome, which is the well woman visit. We're looking a lot into kind of what factors explain getting the health service of a preventive well woman visit. So that might be your outcome if you're uh, um, trying to understand the distribution of um, health services and what helps women get into preventive care. Um, so anyway, these are our two by two table with their A, B, C, D cell, and then you see all the marginals too. So N1 is the total number of exposed, N2 is the total number of unexposed, with this big N being our total sample size, M1 being the total with the disease or health outcome, and M2 being the total without it. Um, and from this two by two table, we can estimate proportions based on these discrete variables. And we use, why the two by two table is so central in EPI is because we use these discrete categories because they might better capture distinct clinical, developmental, or programmatic groupings than a continuous variable might. Um, and binary variables are also the basis for prevalence and risk ratios, prevalence and risk differences, and odds ratios, which are our are, are, are typical um, measures of association that we report in EPI. So here again um, it, are difference and ratio measures that I did mention before, but here are the formulas attached to the two by two table. So our risk difference is going to be the A over N1, so the proportion of the exposed with the outcome minus the proportion of the exposed, I'm sorry, the proportion of the unexposed with the outcome. So C over N2, and that's our formula right here. And risk difference is going to be something we calculate on site too. And then there's risk ratios too, where you take the, the risk in the exposed divided by the risk in the unexposed. And here we have a ratio measure. Um, or it might be a prevalence ratio or risk ratio, depending on how our outcome has been um, measured. Um, so I lied. There is one more poll I forgot. Um, I thought I would actually have you um, estimate a risk difference from this two by two table of um, admittedly fake data. Um, let me just orient you. If you're familiar with SAS and especially with kind of the old school output window in SAS, this is a two by two table from a SAS um, from a SAS analysis where the top value in each cell is the frequency. Um, I always ignore the percent because it's usually pretty meaningless. And the row percent here, um, it's going to be your, your risk or your probability outcome among those that are exposed or those that are unexposed in each cell. Um, so here, what is the crude risk difference from this two by two table um, between the exposed and the unexposed? And I give you four options here, so if you could just take a minute to calculate what that risk difference would be, and you can, um, um, I can't remember if you have the slides, so if you need the formula, I can go back to the formula for a minute. Remember it's A over N1 minus C over N2. 
right here. And I'll go back to, here's your options for your values. So I'll give you a minute, then I'll switch to the poll slide and you can put your answer in. Okay, here is the poll slide with the same choices where you can submit your answer. I apologize, I think I might not have given you enough time, but this is about 15 people, about half of the respondents, um, with 80% of those, so 50% response rate, and 81% of those responders saying none of the above. And you can see that <coughs> the percent changing as more people submit their response. Um, so the majority of you were right that it is none of the above, and those of you in the blue bar just chose to calculate a ratio measure instead of a difference measure. So you took the risk in the exposed over the risk in the unexposed, which is what I think if you've been trained in a typical EPI program, you've been kind of conditioned to do everything in ratio measures. Um, so I'm not surprised and I wouldn't feel bad about it. Um, but what we're going to do is give you a lot of tools to estimate risk differences that are often more useful from a public health perspective. Um, so just to show you the calculation and the actual answer, um, we're going to take the risk in the exposed, which is 11.11, minus the risk in the unexposed, which is 6.67, for a risk difference of 4.44 percentage points. Um, so we'll do more practice on site, and I'll give you more time, I promise. Um, so just to wrap up, because um, we're almost at the end of this webinar, um, I think that hopefully this provided you with um, a high-level kind of review of the statistical methods that we draw upon it, and then how we use our EPI framework um, to guide our use of those mathematical tools. Um, I wanted to just say in closing that the analytic methods need not be simplistic in order to deliver a clear, simple message. So we'll be talking on site a lot about um, kind of presenting our data and translating our data, um, but using the most rigorous methods possible so that nobody can kind of poke a hole in our methods if they don't agree with our findings. Um, so we use that scientific rigor, but then um, come up with ways to communicate our results using a clear and simple message. Um, and an, a well-planned epi analysis plan will help you apply the statistical methods to achieve the most gain um, in terms of informing programs and policies. Um, and I talked about this a little already, but our clear communication of our analytic results um, offers the possibility for improving outcomes um, for MCH populations, and we as MCH EPI leaders have responsibility for planning analyses that will be useful and effectively presenting and translating results. So this gives you an idea of really the goals of this whole training program, and we really do look forward to meeting you on site and delving deeper into needs assessment, analytic methods, program evaluation, and data translation. Um, so thank you all for your attention today and for your participation. It's always very heartening to have people chime in and participate in polls. 
on a webinar when you're just speaking at your phone and you can't see all of your wonderful faces. Um, so I can't wait to be able to connect with you in person next week. Um, are there any questions um, before we wrap up for the day? And if you do, it's star seven to unmute. Okay, I think that's a no. Maureen, um, do we need to do anything else to wrap up? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I need to thank you, Kristen. That was a great presentation. And um, I think everybody's getting excited for next week. I wanted to remind everybody of two things. First of all, you know, this is recorded and archived, and we'll be sending you out the links. But I also wanted to remind you of the um, – we sent you an email letting you know that you have the opportunity to request technical assistance TA time with the faculty. Um, and you just need to send me an email. You have my email address. Um, Kristen, do you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, just a paragraph kind of describing um, the issue you would like technical assistance with um, and the data set you're working on. That will help us to pair you with the appropriate faculty member um, and plan out the TA um, in advance. We'll also have probably some empty slots you can sign up for if you change your mind on site um, and have something you want to either talk about in more depth from one of the lectures for the day or something you brought with from your own work. Um, those should be available to you on site too. Okay, we're all set. See you all in Clearwater next week. Thank you, everyone.